Good morning to you all at home. I really, really hope you well and you enjoyed that live mix we got going there. So to you guys at home, just so amazing to be together in this very weird way. I've got a, one or two guys in the building here helping us um, with this transmission this morning. But just wanted to say to those that managed to make it to the Zoom prayer meeting, that was amazing. So just for you guys that are um, part of The Rock, um, even if you're from a different part of the city, different part of the nation, we do have a Zoom prayer meeting, which was um, going to continue to run before the, prayer meet, before the actual meeting that we're doing now. Um, it's just an opportunity for us to get together, to pray together. We will send the codes out and everything every Sunday morning. We'll start from 20 to 9. So yeah, it's just a great way to see people. Um, to you guys at home, hope you're well, praying lots for you and for your families. Um, yeah, it's just been, as we know, it's been a crazy, crazy time. And this morning, what I've got in store, in mind and heart, is to spend a few moments now just sharing some thoughts around Jesus. And then we've got our very good friends up at 3CR, who we've partnered with for many, many years, Rory Dyer, who you guys know. Got one of his elders, Steve Dollenberg, preaching this morning. Um, he did preach here at The Rock last year or the year before. Just a great man of God, a great father, great friend. A great friend to Monique and I, and um, just a great word that he's got around continuing the, the, um, the series that they're doing with Lamentations, the Megaloth, so he's going to do a part two. For those of you that didn't watch last week, I really encourage you to go and listen to what Rory said last Sunday. You can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, just It's such great theology to, to steady us, to put our feet upon something solid, to help us navigate these times. It's just good, good theology. And then again, Steve Dollenberg this morning does a great job with that. Uh, next Sunday, which will be exciting, is we're going to have our worship team back in the building just to um, lead us in a bit of worship. We've still got a few more weeks of being purely online. Just so you know, the moment uh, President Jerome Poser gives us an opportunity to start meeting, even if in smaller numbers, we will be doing that. But we want to keep it live. We want to keep it flu fluid. We want to keep it authentic. So we're going to try some creative stuff. And just thank you just for being so gracious um, and partnering with us for you guys at home. So I'm going to start by praying. So if you guys are with your families at home, dads and moms, why don't you place your hands on your children if they're around you, um, and then I'm going to pray over us, read a, a scripture around the supremacy of Jesus, and then I'm going to hand over to Steve um, as he just brings the word of the Lord to us today. So, Father God, I thank you this morning. Crazy times that this is, that we've got the technology and the ability to be able to meet like this, Lord God, to be able to meet across our city, across the nations with the technology that we have. I pray over homes right now, Lord Jesus. Let the gracious hand of God be upon our homes. Those that are listening, as my words leave my mouth and enter into your ears, I pray that faith would ignite in your heart to know that no matter what comes our way, Christ has us in the palm of his hand. Christ before us, Christ behind us, Christ above us, Christ leading us. And I thank you today, Jesus, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. Irrespective of what is happening around us, our solid foundation is you, Jesus. For you are above all things. So I pray for grace upon our families. I pray for provision, Lord God. As children are going back to school and all the bills are coming our way, I pray, God, that you would open up the floodgates of heaven and bless us, provide for us, and keep us. I pray for divine health over our bodies. For those of us that may be sick or feeling not well, I pray for health and healing in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, that your scriptures say that in... in in, in Isaiah, when you died, Jesus on the cross, it was not only for the forgiveness of our sins, but also for the healing of our bodies. And we still believe that today. Amen. I'm going to read a scripture over us as a community, and then I'm going to hand over to Steve. It's just such a beautiful scripture. And for those of you this morning that were part of that Zoom prayer meeting, Wendy brought something around Jesus, and it was amazing confirmation for me because I was, what should I read over us this morning? And, and as my, in my prayer time before I came here, I felt to read from Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15, which is such a powerful scripture about the supremacy of Jesus. He is over all things, and it goes like this. For he is, the he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and things on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things are held together. And in him, sorry, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so my encouragement to us this morning is Jesus is the head of the church, that he has supremacy over all things. The Bible says that we live under the sun, and we'll look at it next week as we study um, Ecclesiastes. It talks about under the sun, under the sun, being the sun in the sky. But the sun in the sky um, sends rays of light onto the earth. So we live on the earth under the, the sun. But actually when we live under the sun, Jesus, who is above all of that, we live from a heavenly reality and a heavenly perspective. And so this morning as we sit now to hear the word of the Lord preached, I pray that we would understand not only do we live under the sun, but we live under the sun, S-O-N, Jesus who has supremacy over all things, and he holds us, and he knows everything about us, and he wants us to put our faith in him. We heard last week, Rory said, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, but the Lord Jesus will lead me into quiet waters, green pastures, in Jesus' name. Sit back, guys, grab your Bibles, um, open your hearts as Steve Dollenberg brings the word of the Lord to you this morning for us here at The Rock. We will continue to communicate this week through to you guys, but next week again we'll be live in the same way with our worship team. So bless you guys. Wish I could see you in person, um, but stay strong in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello and welcome to episode number three of our series Megalith. My name is Stephen and it's wonderful to have you guys join us here in the room. We've got people joining us from The Rock and KZN, so lucky to have you join us here. And uh, everyone of 3CR at home, plus our international family as the internet has helped us reach far and wide. This really is a privilege. Um, if we haven't had the chance to meet, I uh, hope one day we'll be able to do that mask free. But for now, we're going to get into the series called Megalith, and you might be wondering what is a megalith or who is megalith actually megalith is a hebrew word it was it's a word that the jews use to speak of five books in the tanakh the tanakh is the the jewish scriptures essentially our old testament and these five books are, are referred to as the megalith in in the tanakh they actually grouped together not so much in our old testament but they are as follows it's lamentations we started that last week ecclesiastes esther ruth and song of songs and what i found this week in preparing for today is i actually discovered that these scriptures are unique in many ways not just because they sort of grouped to attend to some of the darker valleys that we walk through but when a jewish synagogue gathers they, i don't know if you remember when we went through the book of luke Jesus was handed the scroll, he read the scroll, and then they would unpack what had been read, and they still do that to this day. However, the scripture that's passed out is never any of the megalith. The megalith is kept separate for special occasions, for special moments in the year, and it's only then that they actually read these portions in the synagogue. So, for example, Song of Songs they do on Passover, Ruth on Pentecost, Esther on the day of Purim, Ecclesiastes on, uh, during the Feast of the Tabernacles, and then you've got Lamentations. And it's kind of the odd one out, because the other four are all birthed from Scripture as instructions to Scripture, but Lamentations is not. So lamentations actually is tradition, it's human tradition, it's a little bit earthy, as you'll see, and it's, it's a, 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 not quite a feast, it's a day of mourning. It's, it's called Tisha B'Av, and it's a time when they go, they mourn, they sp spend an entire day of grieving, of getting themselves to this place of, of desperation, disillusionment, hopelessness, almost psyching yourself up in the reverse order, if you can call it that. So they would they'd fast, they wouldn't eat any food, but they also wouldn't, they'd avoid laughing, any joy, any color. Some would even bury scripture. They'd go out in the backyard and bury it just in case they happen to pass their Bible and think some positive thoughts. And uh, they'd take off that phylactery just in case they happen to remember a promise that God had given them to truly mourn and grieve. And they would mourn things like the 12 spies going into the promised land, coming back with a bad report, and then not being able to enter that promised land. And an entire generation dying. And they'd spend the day mourning that. They would mourn things like the exile or the Roman oppression. In today's age, I imagine they would mourn the Holocaust and spend a day just in that deep grief and despair and hopelessness. Actually, one of uh, the Jewish scholars framed it like this. He said, uh, you are assumed 
Well, you are expected to assume a character, you've got to love this, of constantly growing sadness. So on the day of Tisha B'Av, you are expected to assume a character of constantly growing sadness. Kind of reminds me of some of the church services I went to as a kid. <laughs> Assuming a character of constantly growing sadness, hopelessness, despair. But here's the thing. Lamentations doesn't instruct us to assume a character of constantly growing hopelessness and sadness. Instead, what Lamentations does is it takes the reader from chapter 1 where that's exactly what we're doing. We're, we're lost in ourselves. The first chapter of Lamentations, actually, I think is nine or ten times, has this cry. Where are you, God? We have no one to help us, no one to comfort us. We are ruined. This is the end. And it, it's meant to, Ecclesiastes, it was Lamentations, it's meant to take us from chapter 1, drag us through the darkness and the ruin of what was happening in their time, to chapter 3, and in the middle of this brokenness and despair, to then remind us of the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning, new in the sense of its fullness, to its overflowing, to the measure that you require. Great is His faithfulness. And then it says, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait on Him. Right there, in the middle of the mess drags us from chapter 1 to chapter 3. And then he grabs us again by the, the collar and drags us through to chapter 5, through the darkness and the despair and the pain, to chapter 5, which is essentially just a river flowing of prayer. And like Rory told us last week, he uses all 22 letters of the Hebrew language to phonetically go A, B, C, D, E, F, all the way through in praying and pursuing the presence of God in chapter 5. And that is... That is the construct of lamentation. That's what the, the underbelly, these deep currents that are happening between chapter 1 and chapter 5. And that is essentially the journey that he would hope us to go on as we read. For the reader to go from chapter 1, this hopelessness, where we are assuming a character of consistently, constantly growing sadness, to this place where we are clinging to our portion, waiting on our God, trusting that he is enough. So my question is, and what I find jumping out of Lamentations is, how? How do you do that? How do you do that with your business, Dimitri, and the battles that you're fighting? And John, how do you do that with an excessive amount of body bags being ordered? How, how do we humanly possibly handle that situation? We've never been this way before. So I want to ask and answer that question using the lens of 2 Kings chapter 4. And give you an idea, because there's a lot happening in, in Lamentations. Give you a framework of what's going on, these undercurrents. Of how we go from chapter 1 to chapter 5. And I'll read it for you. And it says the following. This is uh, 2 Kings chapter 4. You should be very familiar with this portion of scripture. But it says the following. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord, but now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. This is COVID on steroids. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your home? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. A small jar of olive oil. Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask, I love this, don't ask for just a few. Then go inside, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left him and shut the door behind her and her sons, and they brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one, but he replied, there's not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. So she went and told Elisha, and he said, go sell the oil, and pay your debts. You and your sons can live on what is left. I mean, that's a beautiful picture, right? But when you actually understand what's really transpiring here, it will blow your mind. So she goes and she gets a little bit of olive oil. All she has left, the only thing to her name. Some of the translations say, what do you have of value in your home? And this was it. And then she goes and she gets a whole bunch of jars, which is, I mean, that's a big deal, you know? 
If I had to pull this in, it would probably go to there, you know? It's like, mm, okay. N not very impressive. There's not, not much hope there. It's like, oh, okay. But now for you to understand what's going on, in that age, in that context, we would best understand it if this was some Chanel number no. five. Anyone here wear Chanel number no. five? Jan, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, Jan can't because he can't afford it. So that's, a, that's sort of, if you have to e extrapolate it into our current day and age, you, you would have a jar of Chanel number no. five. Okay, now this is where it gets crazy. If she had to pour her, for our sake, Chanel number no. five into this jar, the street value would be 20,000 Rand. That one, 40,000 Rand. The red one, 50,000 Rand. What would you do if you had all this oil and everything you poured it into turned into tens of thousands of Rands? You would probably do what I would do. I would enter empty Noah's lunchbox. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, there's a good couple hundred rand right there. Yeah. Because here's the thing. So he says, go get a jar. But the word actually isn't the, like the literal word jar. It's the Hebrew word keli. And keli is pretty much anything that you can fill. You, know, you can fill your crocs. I would fill my crocs. I would, I would empty my fridge. I would turn it on its side and I would, I would pour. You know that if you had to take your bath, just a small bath. We have two, one large, one for the kids. If we take our kids' bath and we filled it up, the amount of Chanel number no. five that we have in there will have the street value of six million rand. And he says to her, get jars, not a few. This is a few. Get as many jars as you can handle, as many Kellys as you can handle. Empty the fridge, grab the rain gauge, take your shoes, have your kids stand and cup their hands for goodness sake. There's like at least 16 rand in there. Yeah. What is it that you have in your house to fill? Wouldn't you do that? Wouldn't you grab whatever you could lay your hands on? Okay, so this is what the writer of Lamentations is saying. In verse 5, it says, they brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. They brought the jars to her and she kept pouring. What Lamentations is saying is bring your jar to Jesus and he will keep pouring. You see, it's not so obvious in the book of Lamentations itself, other than the fact that what Rory said last week is the context for Lamentations is Jeremiah 52, if you were taking notes. In Jeremiah 52, everything that the prophet Jeremiah has been speaking now comes to pass. The northern kingdoms descend on Israel and Judah and they obliterate them. It's like you don't read that before bed, Jeremiah 52, of what they do to the people of God. But that's the climax. That's the end of Jeremiah. That's Jeremiah 52. There's still Jeremiah 1 and 2 and 3. And if we rewind, as he would have known, going back to the very beginning, this is what you find in Jeremiah chapter 2. It says the following. It says, be appalled at this, you heavens. These are heavy words. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. Thank you, but we have better plans. And they have made their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. See, Lamentations is saying, bring your jar to Jesus, that he can fill it. Because what we've seen is a generation who said, thank you, but no thank you. Spring of living water, we'll do our own thing. And they've made their own jars, cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And that is who the writer of Lamentations writes to. That. And he says, don't you know, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. The steadfast love of the Lord. And right here, the spring of living water says, bring me your jars. Bring me your jars. Bring me your jars. What is your jar? Raquel? Clint? 
What, what's your job? Jan? Wendy? You know, I, I mentioned that it's Kelly in the Jewish, uh, or the Hebrew. It's a container, and depending on the context, they use the, the word that would best suit it, like in this case, a jar. But in this case, as we just read, she goes and she sells it. This, this jar was filled with provision. Maybe your jar is the desperate need for provision. Hey, Lil? Too much month at the end of your money, business flailing. We had the incredible privilege, uh, November, December last year, of walking a journey with a couple, a young married couple, and they felt the time was right to buy a home. And so they had come in with us and, and said, listen, we, we need you to just help us out. You know, we, we don't even know where to begin. What does a good house look like and a good price and all of that? And we walked them through all of it. And right at the very end, they'd done all the documentation, signed everything that they needed to sign. They even paid the deposit. This was like the final step. They go to the agency, make sure everything's sorted out. The lawyers are there. And just before they're done and dusted, uh, the lady says across the table, says, don't forget, you, know, you still need to pay your deposit and that needs to be in by. And they like, oh, hang on a second. Um, we paid that last week already. And they're like, whoa, no, no, we haven't received anything from you. And they double checked. Long story short, it turns out that they're uh, someone had hacked into the system, changed the banking account details and the email they received, and they paid it into a fraudulent account. Nearly 200,000 Rand. Whew. Talk about an empty jar. I mean, think about it. You've been saving your entire married life, all the movies and dinners out that you've skipped to put some money aside. You know, that, that holiday that you kind of cut short so you can put an extra thousand Rand into eventually buying a home, paying that deposit, now it's gone. And they rush to the bank and the account is empty already. Nothing they can do. And so on a Friday night, they come to our house. They're sitting at our, our dining room table and they are just broken. That's them. Just broken. What do you do? And they're full of emotions and turmoil. And I, at the end of the night, I said, you have to essentially go and find out, you know, what do you have faith for? Do we go to the ombudsman? Do you get lawyers? Do you turn this thing ugly? Do you hire black hats and you hack the daylights out of their system? <laughs> like, what do you do? And so we sent him home that night and he sent me this message in the early hours of the morning. I want to read it to you. He said, so when I went to bed last night, this verse popped into my head. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. <laughs> I read the paragraph and this was the verse just before it. And if anyone should sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Then I read the whole chapter, and this stood out. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Yeah. Essentially, he was saying, I resign myself to taking my jar to Jesus. He said, Lord, you know. You know. You know the ruin. You know the broken future, the hopelessness. Would you drag me to this place and fill my jar? Now, the incredible thing is it wasn't even a week, but they got a message from the bank, a random query, dear Mr. So-and-so, we just wanted to follow up um, about this bank account that you transferred money into. Were there any suspicions or any irregularities around that? And he quickly picked up the phone and, and explained the story. Apparently, they had flagged the account. And so when this large amount of money was put into it, they quickly removed it out so that the people that were under suspicion couldn't get their hands on it. And they transferred the money back. They didn't even charge them bank fees. You know? It was like the entire, every last cent. Now that's incredible. But that's like Chanel number five. That's not like the streams of living water is the fact that they know for the rest of their lives at that place, the depth and the maturity of their faith and their trust in their heavenly, they know that they have in it, in themselves, the faith to trust in their heavenly father, whose love never fails, whose mercies are new every morning, whose faithfulness is as he says it to be. What are your jars? Whew. Maybe they're not as big, maybe they're a little smaller. But what are your jars? Maybe it's provision. Maybe that you're at the end of your rope. Maybe it's a client that's said thanks but no thanks and everything's already been produced. I don't know, Mark and Monique, what is your jar? What is it that you are bringing before God, travailing in prayer and trusting that God fills it for you? 
I want to let you guys know, in this room, as well as those watching, I have been praying for your job. I've been taking your job before God. Since the start of lockdown last year, March, I have been praying that the Lord provides exceedingly abundantly above. That he shows you that he is your portion and your cup. And you have a delightful inheritance because you have him. Lil, I've been praying for you by name daily. Because you've been on my heart and you represent the single moms that have to go through all of this without anyone to lean on, without a provider, without someone to fight their battles on her behalf. And I pray that bring your job before God and say, Lord God, would you, would you fill this for Lil? Would you fill this for our single ladies? Would you fill this for the elderly? What is your job? Because one of them, at Kelly, is a jar filled with provisions. Another one, interestingly enough, is it can be used in the context of work. You know, I suppose, Dimitri, you know, you, if you're a chef, you would fill this with ingredients. Or if you own a retail store, you could fill a container with goods. Or if you're a tradesman with your tools or an artist with your, your paints and your paintbrushes. Maybe that's what you're crying out to God. You say, Lord, I don't know if I can make another lockdown. Now there's rumors. A third wave in May. What do I do? What do I do? I, one of the jars I'm lifting before God is a, a specific doctor in Cape Town heard via via that she's taking extreme strain. So in, in the Cape, because of the amount of, you know, they're, in a, they're a hot spot. And because of the amount of cases, they're really struggling at the moment. And they're roping everyone in, even students, to come and administer uh, COVID treatment and and she said something very interesting that I never really realized is the fact that when you're a doctor and you're involved in trauma, you become familiar with death from time to time. But just think of an ENT or yeah, a, a GP. You might go your entire career without encountering death on your watch. And now they are facing that every single day. And she tells a story of how um, one of her patients just asked for a pen and paper because I don't know if you've been to a hospital during lockdown. No visitors. My wife had to drop me at the door and the comment to her was, ma'am, we'll phone you when he's fixed. So you go in there with this life-threatening disease and it's like, we'll phone you when he's fixed, if he's fixed. And so he had asked the, the, the doctor attending to him, please, just for a pen and paper, he wants to write uh, his thoughts down for his family, handed it to her, and an hour later he died. That's her heart. That's her hope. Shattered. She is finished. She cannot... I'm just saying, Lord, I don't know what my neighbor is going through. I don't know what you are going through. I don't know what it is that you are going home to and that desperate cry, Lord Jesus, if you don't come through for me, if you don't fill my jar. But I do know if you take your jar to Jesus, he will fill it. What is your jar? The third one I really like. Um, it's, yeah, they're all dark. I won't say this one's a little lighter. But... It is sometimes Kelly refers to a musical instrument. I suppose you can turn the jar upside down and you've got a, yeah, a drum or the guitar. I would have filled that guitar with Chanel number no. five. Yeah? <laughs> it can hold liquid long enough to get to the market. Yeah? So it, it refers to a musical instrument, which caught my attention because right at the very beginning of uh, Lamentations, actually in chapter 1 verse 4, it says the following. It says, The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed feasts. All her gateways are desolate, her priests groan, her young women grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. And that caught my attention. The roads to Zion mourn. Saul Street mourns. On a Sunday morning, that tar used to wake up to the sound of traffic coming to worship a king. Terrament, uh, clothes down in Mslunga, South Beach Road mourns. N Street, James, and Middleburg mourns. It groans because the saints aren't gathering to worship. The people who need hope aren't finding hope. It says, for no one comes to her appointed festivals. No one's gathering. This community is, is fragmenting, and we're trying to find a way to get into God's presence. It goes on to say, all her gateways are desolate. No happy yellow hands, no big smiles, Yeah. I realize today we've had more funerals on the property this year than we've had church services. Uh, Gallup 
the guys who do the, the polls and the studies um, around elections, they just released new findings. They did a study on mental health. And they found that mental health is in decline across all the demo, uh, demographics. And we're not just talking decline, we're talking at, like a cliff face. Mm -hmm. It is plummeting. All them, it doesn't matter how old you are, it doesn't matter how fit you are, it doesn't matter how wealthy you are, it doesn't matter what part of the country you live in, except for one demographic. And that is those, and now this is a secular study, so this, yeah, the framing is a little bit clunky, but they're saying essentially those who carry the disciplines of their church. They have maintained, we have maintained a mental health that is able to sustain us. Why? Because we find ongoingly the discipline of taking our jaws to Jesus and allowing him to fill. You know, what, what is your jaw? I've been praying for you. I've been praying over you, not just in this room, even over the rock, over the 3CR. I've been praying for you. I've been praying for your job, for your mental health. I've been praying specifically, Zechariah 3.17, which says the following, says, The Lord your God is in the midst of you. I'm like, Lord, would you be in the midst of us? Would you fill our job? The Lord your God is in the midst of you. And the next line says, a Savior who saves. Oh, Lord, fill our job with the Savior who saves. And it says, He will rejoice over you with joy. He will exalt over you with singing. Where we are mourning that he will give us singing, his singing. You know, I, th I think of that seashell you put to the, your ear and you hear this, um, it's like, Lord, can I hear your singing? Can I hear you sing over me? Can I hear your hope? Can it flow? One of my favorite verses, Isaiah 64, 4 says the following, says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard from the ancient of times, a God who works while his people wait. Incredible. It's like a God who works while we wait. Some of the translation who says he labors on our behalf while we wait. I said, God, Jesus, will you fill my jug? Will you fill my jar? Will you take these containers and will you fill them? What is your jar? Because that's what the writer of Lamentations is essentially getting at. When you find this Jesus, when you find the steadfast love of the Lord that never ceases. When you find that mercy that never ends, that's new every morning. He says, I'm going to camp there. The Lord is my portion. The Psalm says, the Lord is my portion and my cup. He holds my lot secure. What is your jar? I'm going to close with one last one. And this is in Psalm 56. It says, you keep a record of all my sorrows, talking of the Lord. You keep a record of all my sorrows and gather all my tears in your jar. You keep a record of all my sorrows and gather all my tears in your jar. Those tears that you prayed that fell on the floor there earlier on this evening are in his jar. And you know, if I were to cry, you know where Jesus would have to be to gather my tears for his jar? Right here. So that he can stretch and catch it on my cheek, put it in his jaw. What an incredible picture. You see, we're not just going, trying to find that wise man at the top of the mountain. Oh, mighty guru, fill this jaw. Actually, he's right here. Right in the midst of all the brokenness, our shattered dreams, our hope, our pain, our despair. While we're off assuming a character of constantly growing sadness, he's right here, catching every one of those tears. And this is almost as if he comes and he says, let's do a bit of a transaction. I'll take your tears, you take my joy, you take my hope, you take my steadfast love, you take my mercy, you take my promise, you take my faithfulness. So I want to invite you, I want to invite you 3CI, I want to invite you in the room, and I want to invite you guys at the rock. In this time, would you be found taking your jar to Jesus? Father, I love to take your word and make these deep weighty truths, simple, but in no way is it a reflection of the simplicity of, of the struggles that we might be facing. To hear of a friend who's had 10 people die in the last two weeks of COVID and the battle and the stress and the strain as a superficial believer of how could God and where is God, hearts that lie shattered on the floor. Lord, we, on behalf of everyone in this room, on behalf of our beloved 3CI, and on behalf of everyone at The Rock, and 
those in ministry, those who are carrying this load on behalf of others as well as themselves, on behalf of husbands and wives and families and finances and futures. Lord, I pray that we would find a way to bring you our jar. But I ask, Lord Jesus, would you also in that place fill those jars with your supernatural provision, your presence, with a knowledge of who you are and who we are to you, Will you fill these jars to overflowing? Lord, I love, I think it's the message that said, to the brim and then some. Overflowing, exceedingly abundantly above. Lord, I rejoice in the fact that the mental health of those who are simply attending to the disciplines of their church has stayed strong because that is the God I serve. But Lord, I pray that where there are cracks, where we've made these cisterns and it's not holding water, would you come, Lord Jesus? Or would you come and heal and restore would you come and strengthen and provide? Would you come and build us up, whether it's emotionally, physically, financially? Would you carry us, Lord? We place our jars at the feet of the one who works for those who wait on him. And we entrust our tomorrow to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining the Rock Church broadcast service. We have reached the end of our service today. To find out more about who we are, visit our website at www.therock.org.za or contact our office on office at therock.org.za. Please join us again next week, the same time on the same platform.